Okay, so I know this may be an exorbitant amount of trust to put into somebody you just met, but I want you to close your eyes. Come on now, close them. Now, tell me if you recognize any of these sound effects. What you're hearing is effectively the sound of Cartoon Network. But do you ever wonder who was responsible for this sound? Do you ever sit chained up in your cave watching silhouettes of cartoon characters dance across the walls and hope against hope that someday an enlightened YouTube video essayist will come and sever the chains at long last rescuing you from perpetual benightedness? Well, to say that you're in for a humdinger is putting it lightly, my friend. White guy making 6 to 27 minute videos about increasingly esoteric obsessions What an original concept, the original concept, no one's ever done it before What an original concept, the original concept, no one's ever done it before The late 90s are what many consider a renaissance in original creator-driven cartoons, due in no small part to the fact that the late 90s were when Cartoon Network stopped being just a place for Ted Turner to air a bunch of Warner Brothers and Hanna-Barbera stuff he had the rights to, and started being a breeding ground for new, fresh ideas by young creators. Early days, I walked through a place and know everybody named. Those days over. The creators who grew up on the very stuff that was being aired by Cartoon Network at the time. And if there was any time for mashing old ideas together and remixing them and modernizing them and creating new amazing shit, it was the 90s. Among these creators were Gendy Tartakovsky, who created Dexter's Laboratory, and Craig McCracken, who made the Powerpuff Girls. Tell us about your cartoon. Yeah, Dexter is a boy genius. And, uh, he uh -huh. roll it. Premiering in 1996, Dexter was Cartoon Network's first totally original series to not be based on an existing property or be just an interstitial between repackaged older shows, and Powerpuff Girls followed soon after in 1998, and ended up becoming a rating smash hit that Cartoon Network is still trying to milk. Uh, so you could probably imagine both shows had kind of a generation-defining effect on cartoons. These shows were kind of companion pieces to one another in a lot of ways. Uh, McCracken and Tartakovsky would work on each other's shows, and they shared a lot of crew members. And it led to them having the same sort of feel. And way later, Ian Jones Cordy, creator of OKKO, OK would describe this feel as... Anna Barbanime. We take the limited motion simple drawing from Hanna-Barbera and the stylized action and quick cutting of anime and sort of mesh together so well. It should be noted that McCracken has said that the most direct influence on him and Tartakovsky in so far as the quick rhythmic cutting was actually Sam Raimi's directing work on movies like Army of Darkness and the incredibly underrated Hudsucker Proxy. If you watch Hudsucker Proxy, there's sequences in there. They're all just visual storytelling dramatic compositions, um, dramatic camera work. There's an entire sequence that I think was directed by Sam Raimi where there's the invention of the hula hoop and the distribution of the hula hoop and then the catching on of the hula hoop. There's not a word of dialogue in it. And I remember Genny and I sitting in the theater just going, this is how we make cartoons. This is visual cartoon storytelling. And the same with um, Army of Darkness, you know, there's that sequence when Ash builds the robot glove. Like that was Gendy's Bible when we were on Dexter's, you know, who wants up? Who wants up? But whether incidentally or not, there's definitely anime DNA in there. And I think hanna Barbanime is a pretty apt description. Uh, but beyond just the visuals and the directing, I think something else contributes greatly to that Hanna-Barbanime feel. Something that I don't think gets talked about nearly enough. The sound effects. Remember when I said that Dexter and Powerpuff Girls had a lot of the same crewmates? Well, one of those crewmates, and the guy that this video is about, is the sound effects guy, Joel Valentine. Day, 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 
The next thing I'm going to tell you might be a little difficult to accept. Uh, so I've included a timestamp here in case you want to skip past it. All right. This isn't actually a picture of Joel Valentine. It's a picture of a funny dog wearing sunglasses. What the fuck? What the fuck? Damn. But more on that in a second. Look, shows have huge sound crews. The sound editors, post-production, pre-production, mixing, engineering, and far be it from me to understate the importance of all those guys, but Joel is the guy that people point to when it gets asked who is responsible for crafting the sound of these cartoons. Craig McCracken and Gendy Tartakovsky have each said that Joel is the guy they go to for sound effects, and he's been working with them for their whole careers. That includes Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, Samurai Jack, Wander Over Yonder, Symbionic Titan, Kid Cosmic, Prime his audio thumbprints are all over these shows. And Joel's amazing because he really understands when I make a sound effect, he understands what I mean. You know, so if I go a or a doink, he knows exactly what that is. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me for this video being super speculative. Uh, there actually isn't a whole lot I can say about Joel Valentine the guy, and that's because there really isn't anything on him anywhere. Uh, there's no interviews with him, images and video of him are sparse, and hell, his name isn't even in the credits of most of the stuff he's done. It kind of feels like that's on purpose, though. Uh, people who have worked with Joel, like Primal Sound Editor Grant Muir, has described Joel as a humble guy who often likes to fly under the radar. Radar. Joel's name may not be in the credits of Powerpuff Girls, but Craig McCracken made it clear that 21st Century Entertainment, the name listed under sound editing, is Joel's company, and that he wanted to be credited that way. Which is kind of the main reason I just have him as the world's coolest dog in this video. And the reason I don't really want to dig too deep into him beyond just his career, if anything to respect the dude's privacy. What I want to go over is like how instrumental Valentine's work is in nailing the hanna barbana ness of these cartoons. See, the trajectory of sound design work in TV animation could actually be compared to the trajectory of music production, in the way that it's evolved from being more acoustically recorded stuff with some tape splicing to being more digital and sample based. In the really early days, cartoon sound designers were dudes who would like put a fork in a potato and weld it to a crank operated bike spoke and then record themselves turning it while blowing bubbles out of a saxophone and I don't know dude it was just fucked up. Getting around the late 80s into the 90s though with the increasing digitization of sound design and studios wanting to make stuff more efficient and cost effective uh, sounds for cartoons that were recorded from the 30s to the 60s now existed as huge libraries of audio files that were commercially licensed out. Cartoon sounds we all grew up on. Decades of animation experience. You remember them. Joel had a massive collection of sound effects stored on piles of floppy diskettes. Why don't you throw down a couple dozen of those hot diskettes? And he was actually editing and assembling sound effects tracks for shows using an early digital audio workstation called the ADAP Sound Rack, which was a piece of hardware that you'd hook up to an Atari ST computer that also came with software for editing the sounds. It's said to have been on the cheaper side compared to other DAWs at the time. Being a sound designer for TV gradually started to bear more and more resemblance to being a hip-hop producer. Sound designers would still occasionally create sounds from scratch, but most of the work is basically crate digging through these huge sound effect libraries and sort of mixing, matching, and combining them. I've never seen this one, so I'm kind of tripping out. And I can't really think of anything more fitting for this era of cartoons. It feels like Joel Valentine totally understood about as much as anyone in the core creative team that these shows were all about creating new ideas out of chopped and screwed older ideas. Cartoon Network, especially around this time, felt like it was all about being given the keys to a huge library of classic cartoon assets and characters and being able to just do whatever the hell you wanted with them. Why are we so lame, Yogi? What I'm getting at is Joel will use sound effects from the Hanna-Barbera library. So long, little Hank. And he'll use stuff from the Warner Brothers library. But he'll also use stuff that was really clearly sampled from like 70s mecha animes?
then he'll mix and match and recontextualize sound effects until you don't know which ones are anime, which ones are stock cartoon stuff, and which ones are just like weird stuff he invented. One of my favorite examples of this sort of thing is in Powerpuff Girls. There's a stock Hanna-Barbera sound effect that they would use for like poofs of magic. Shazam will serve them. <laughs> <laughs> but Joel takes that sound effect and turns it into like an anime impact sound that he would use to beef up punches during fight scenes. Like whenever he wanted to convey that a punch had superhuman strength behind it. You want proof for the Powerpuff Girls? Well, here it comes. <laughs> and it's pretty damn effective. <laughs> To the point that you wouldn't even realize this is a Hanna-Barbera sound effect. It just feels so at home with the other punchy anime sound effects. And that's what I love, his technique of finding the missing links between sound libraries from completely disparate time periods and cultural contexts. When you go through the publicly available CDs of these sound libraries yourself, it really makes you appreciate the process of being a sound designer and puts into perspective how inventive Joel gets when he assembles things. Like, I imagine Joel saying stuff like, hmm, this sound effect is labeled electronic magic, but I wonder how it would sound as like a superhero flying away sound effect. This is the sound of a school bell ringing. But hey, if I pitch it down a few steps, it kind of sounds like the sound a character would make when they lose their goddamn mind in a fit of panic. Joel's role as a sound guy is incredibly important to the tone of what he's working on, and I feel like he's sort of a genius when it comes to knowing when to be silly and when to be serious. He can do the really cartoony style that's less diegetic and more like a megaphone held up to the character's deep and immediate wants in a scene, but he also knows we want the cool, punchy action sound effects for the fight scenes, and he knows when to downplay it and let the atmosphere take center stage. If you think about it, having a sound guy with that kind of range was incredibly important to shows like Samurai Jack and Primal that have lots of long stretches with barely any music or dialogue. Would this scene have worked as well if he approached everything in the same over-the-top cartoony sort of way? Probably not. This is a guy who has an acute awareness of when to be cartoony and when to be grounded. A cursory look into Valentine's IMDB page reveals that, fittingly enough, some of the earliest experience he had was on anime dubs. He's credited as a re-recording mixer on some Galaxy Express 3.9 stuff, some Macross and Robotech stuff, and even, the, oh, Macron 1. <laughs> A sort of a Robotech-esque show in that it chops up two existing animes, Sengoku Majin Go Shogun and Mission Outer Space... Uh, yeah, and combines them into one show. Uh, by the way, kind of a tangent, but the Go Shogun movie, The Time Etranger, fucking rules, and you don't need to watch the show to understand it. Check it out if you can. The, anyway, up until this point, Joel had only really been credited on the production end, basically mixing and editing already existing audio tracks. But interestingly enough, Macron is the first time he's credited for just sound effects. It wasn't all too uncommon in early anime localizations to completely redo all the music and sound effects, and comparing Macron 1 to Go Shogun, it seems that's what happened. <laughs> could be safely assumed that Joel is the one responsible for the sound effects track in the localization. Even though the sound effects track in Macron is fundamentally completely different from the sound effects track in the two sourced animes, uh, Joel still tries to incorporate sound effects from the original shows, albeit rearranged and remixed. This might very well be where a lot of the anime sound effects in Joel's library come from, including the iconic... Relax, huh? Who are you? It's possible Joel had the 100% correct opinion that mecha anime sound effects are the coolest shit ever, and decided to either yoink or use his connections to legally acquire them, and just kind of hung on to them until later when he'd do Dexter.
Interestingly too, he has credits on some decently well-known live-action movies. This is kind of when he starts to get credited less and less for mixing sounds and more and more for creating sounds. There's lots of random horror movie sequels like Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, Nightmare on Elm Street 4, Howling uh, uh, 6, House 2, The Second Story, uh, oh, I get it. The second story. Uh, man, Kimiko Ikigami must be falling on hard times. He worked on Robocop 2, Karate Kid Part 3, King Ralph, The Wizard, fucking North Shore. A surf movie my dad actually showed me when I was a kid. I tried to tell you, man. Nobody listens to Turtle. And the point break. Huh. It's interesting seeing that he has experience on more grounded live action stuff because it might explain that level of versatility he has. I'm not totally sure what happened between Point Break and Yo Yogi, but so far as I can tell, that's his first credit at Hanna-Barbera, where he'd end up working on Dexter's Lab. Uh, Yo Yogi's sound design mainly plays a pretty textbook Hanna-Barbera. I think it's on Dexter that he really gets to cut loose and go wild. Also, at some point in his career, Joel Valentine actually acted as a mentor to Jeff Hutchins, who's another sound designer with a metric fuck ton of credits, and you may be familiar with his work on a little show called SpongeBob. Bob goddamn motherfucking sons of bitching square pants. That's right, this man is inadvertently who we have to thank for the boo womp sound effect. In all seriousness though, it makes way too much sense that the sound effects guy for Spongebob was mentored by Valentine, because Spongebob is another show that just has a really idiosyncratic and immediately recognizable sound design style. Even though Joel Valentine is a name that not a lot of people know, he does actually seem to have kind of a small but devoted fan base among sound design nerds. A lot of the stuff I've learned about Joel is from a place called the Sound Effects Wiki, which is sort of trying to be a database cataloging stock sound effects used in all forms of media. And sure, it's a little disorganized, but like, it's really neat to have kind of a resource on stuff that there just isn't much on anywhere. Also, do you remember that meme that was going around for a while where people were putting Ed Ed and Eddie sound effects over things? <laughs> There's actually a much less popular version of that meme where people put Joel Valentine sound effects over things, and it's actually kind of cool. People put a lot of work into these things. Like, there's entire OVAs that have been edited to just have Joel Valentine sound effects. People putting Herculean amounts of effort and passion into extremely recondite things is something that never ceases to invigorate me creatively. Not only that, but if you check the credits for Primal, who's that? Hey, hey, hey it's about damn time. So I, I don't know, maybe things are looking up for the guy. Just as well, because I think he might be my favorite sound designer. And, and it was kind of neat looking into this stuff and learning a little more about him. But anyway, I don't really know how to end videos. So to close out, I guess I'll make my own Joel Valentine sound effects video. <laughs> Oh, 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 why don't you go? Oh, so, oh, oh.